This is the wall of the Nazi fortress. All the skill of a brutally great military and engineering people have gone into the construction of this wall. Today, boys from New York and London, from Seattle and Manchester, from Toronto and Montreal, from Marseilles, Warsaw and Prague, from Narvik, and from thousands of other Allied homes, are doing what Hitler and Napoleon dared not do, cross the waters of the English Channel and attack the fortified coast on the other side. The target is the German army and its leaders, who are probably not smiling today. In the hills of Persia last December, today's fighting on the coast of France was planned and put on the Allied calendar. In Britain, the dispossessed soldiery of Europe prepared for the voyage home. The Dutch. The Poles. The Czechs. The Norwegians remembering the bitter spring of 1940. From the New World came the Americans. And on their own soil, the British who prepared for a different invasion four years ago. All waiting for the signal from the men who had beaten the German in Africa, Sicily and Italy and were now turning their attentions to the Germans in the West. Invasion was every freighter, luxury liner, transport we could lay our hands on. Invasion was the Navy and Coastal Command aircraft fighting their unending war with a Nazi submarine fleet over all the sea and air highways to Britain. Invasion was the Navy winning that war and making safe landfall with iron treasure from America and the British Commonwealth. The smoky docks against which the Nazis had vainly sacrificed the cream of the Luftwaffe rumbled with the weight of British and American arms and equipment. GIs and Lance Corporals and grizzled civilian longshoremen worked the cranes and hooks that swung the martial wealth of the free world onto the soil of Britain. Here was Montana's copper, Australia's wheat, Pennsylvania's steel, Texas cattle, the nimble fingers of the women in the aircraft factories of California, the sweat and muscle of the Canadian mines. determination of the United Nations to come to a decision this year in Europe. Here were the men who had come to stand side by side with their allies, facing the European coast from the Arctic tip of Norway to the Bay of Biscay. the labor went on. At night, too, other guests prepared to visit New York without invitation. With Britain's young heroes through the men of the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force and backing the enormous flow of highly trained flying men into the operational squadrons was the great British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Its training fields stretching across Canada from coast to coast. The RAF, Avengers of Warsaw, Rotterdam, Coventry, London, penetrated night after night through the dark weather over Europe to pound the strategic factories and concentration points of Hitler's empire. The aircraft factories, the munition works, the truck assembly plants, the power plants, Munich, Hamburg, Cologne, Nuremberg, Brunswick, Frankfurt, Hanover, Essen, Berlin. Along the bombed roads of Britain, the star, now worn not only by American but by all Allied vehicles, became as familiar as the advertisement for Bass's A. On rubber and steel, the goods of war rolled to dispersal and distribution points throughout Great Britain. 
there to be stored against the day of need. Countless man hours, tremendous feats of energy and organization went into the job of supplying the greatest invasion force in history. From Allied factories flowed the weapons of freedom. The vast potential of the American industry was being realized and added to the output of Great Britain. Night and day, the vast business of assembly went on in preparation for the coming attack. And to carry all this, locomotives, freight cars for the railway lines of the continent. stretched its long lines of tanks and guns and vehicles down the rolling English roads. To the enemy, a growing menace. To the Allies, the climax of years of endurance and endeavor. stores had to be protected from German air attack. Men of the Home Guard, women of the ATS and Americans stood to the guns. In the waters round Europe, a naval wall was built and maintained. Nowhere, not even in the coastal waters of Germany, could the enemy move with impunity. Mines from aircraft and patrol vessels. Warships of all the Allies relentlessly met each challenge on the sea. Minesweepers cleared the lanes for our own shipping, our own landing craft, whilst motor torpedo boats, destroyers, cruisers, battleships and aircraft slammed the waning and bedeviled sea strength of the German power. Crippled and bleeding, the German Navy clung to its harbors. Every day was D-Day for the Air Force. From dawn to dawn, the sound of aeroplane engines filled the air. England, now a green and pleasant, unsinkable aircraft carrier, launched immense fleets of planes to scourge the enemy in Europe, blow down his factories, tear up his railroads, explode his ammunition dumps, fight his Air Force out of the sky, kill his troops, wherever they were to be found. Europe was safe against the onslaughts of the Dominion and American Air Force and the RAF. Long-range fighters swept the skies all the way to Berlin for the daylight raiders and the forts and liberators. The highways to Germany were lined with flak, and the best pilots of the Luftwaffe still hurled themselves against the fire of the Ford's 50s and the Lightning's cannon. were dropped. On the oil refineries, the aircraft factories, the ball bearing plants, on Schweinfurt, Bremen, Kiel, Wilhelmshaven, on the German production centers in France, beating Nazi war industry to its knees with a merciless arithmetic of bomb tonnage. 